Oh, it looks like it worked. <laughs> Let me just double check. Yeah, looks like it worked. Well, um, <clears throat> thanks everybody for tuning in today. And I'm here with a very special guest today. Uh, Keith Sarabaika is here with us, and many of us will uh, recognize him as uh, the voice actor in many of our favorite video games. But of course, his career goes far beyond just, um, uh, just video games, and he's been in a number of different projects from film to television spanning several, several decades. So I'm really grateful to have him with us today. Oh, of course, I'm glad is... to be here. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, this is part of our uh, charity live stream, Fallout for Hope, and we've been doing a great job. We're already past the 10,000 mark at 10,700. And I've got the donate link in the chat below if you'd like to join us and participate in donating to charity. And many thanks to Keith for participating with us today. Well, I hope I don't scare donors away. Well, I think that would be a pretty hard thing to do. You're going to be the primary attraction, I think. Well, we'll see. Well, um, now, obviously, your career has just been absolutely huge for a very long time. And uh, many, of, many of the people in the chat are going to recognize your voice and your face from uh, a variety of uh, different shows. And some of the, uh, the major ones, however, that I think this community is going to remember you far are um, many of the video games that I have been covering because I broadcast vi uh, certain games on my channel and uh, you've had a voice in so many of them. He played uh, the role of the Reaper Harbinger in Mass Effect 2 as well as doing additional voices in Mass Effect 2 and 3. He was the didact in Halo 4. Let me know if I get anything wrong because this goes on and on and on. Right so far. Man. Cornelius right so far. Slate in Bioshock Infinite. And you played additional voices in Bioshock 2. All of these games which we broadcast on the show. I, I did Bioshock. I, I, did, I, I think I was Reed Wall in Bioshock 1. Uh, maybe, maybe, And then I was somebody else in, in Bioshock 2. And then Bioshock Infinite I was in as well. I didn't know about uh, 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 Reed Wall. But I did know you did additional voices in Bioshock yeah. 2. And uh, yeah. Cornelia Slate in uh, Bioshock Infinite. And I, we actually played Grim Fandango for the first time um, a couple of months ago. And... Play Bowsley, gay Hispanic florist. I, right. I know, that shocked me, right? I had no idea because I missed it when it came out in the 90s, and so I decided to play it again. And then all of a sudden, it was I one of the first video games I did. I, I think it was like, I think it was like second or third. Maybe, maybe it was It was very early on in my video game career, you know. As yeah. I recall. yeah, we go to, to the florist, and I suddenly hear your voice. I'm like, wait a minute, is that the voice of Joshua Grant? He's a skeleton florist in Grim Fandango. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> I was a, I was a skeleton. Uh, I played uh, Hispanic. <laughs> so that threw me for a loop. And of course, the voice of Joshua Graham in Fallout New Vegas, Herschel Biggs in L.A. Noir, another game I did a lore series on here that I was just floored to find you in that game as well. And then most that was recently, a lot of fun. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm gonna, I can't wait to ask you about that because I mean, I, I don't even know how how that happened. Like how the whole uh, image capture thing worked like how did you get into that was it just like much of did, did you slip into it seamlessly from all of your previous acting experience or was it well i mean it's you know acting is acting you know so uh and and now now that now the gardeners are coming but i hope they don't uh drown me out um i, I can't hear them okay good um but they're they're just they're, they're distracting me um i uh there was it, what we actually did in that was we would go into a cold room and they did a thing called I did a thing called facial contouring. Someone else actually did the <laughs> capture, but I did the, the the voiceover and the and what they called facial contouring, which we would sit in in a in a like a barber chair in this cold room with fifty six cameras in it, and um and be I'd be wrapped from my neck down in an orange uh sort of drape, and uh, then we'd have a monitor with the lines on it, although you like long speeches I had to have memorized and we would shoot 75 80 pages a day you know which was a lot you know that is a lot yeah in LA Noir you come in uh, uh briefly in acts one and two but you have a major role in the final act of the game as Cole Phelps's partner um right in the arson sequence yeah and also I think I think I'm the narrator at the beginning 
if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. You're not mistaken. Yeah, you also did the narration at the very beginning, um, yeah. which because I had remembered your voice during the narration, and I'm like, what did they, did they hire him just for the narration? And then I get into the the last act, and there you are, and it's your face, and I'm like, well, they got him back there too as well. There, there were a bunch of great guys. There were a bunch of Australian guys from uh, it was called Team Bondi. Yeah, from uh, Bondi Beach in Sydney, Australia, and uh, we should, although we shot it here in a warehouse in uh, in uh, in Culver City, you know, off Jefferson Boulevard, but it was, um, it was great. I mean, it was a really fun job. Now, I actually, I didn't get that through my voiceover agents and they were a little angry. I got it through my, my theatrical agents. They never had sent me up for anything like that before. And they'd sent me up for this one and, and uh, I got hired, you know, so it was fun. So I didn't realize because I've, I've never been into Hollywood or anything like that, but you've got different agents for the different types of acting that you do. Yeah. I have a voiceover agent, uh, who handles my voiceover stuff and I have a theatrical agent who handles everything theatrical like movies, TV, plays, whatever, you know. Well, how do you balance all of that different work? Because you've got such an extensive uh, history in film, television and video games. I just take each job one at a time, do it as they come along. You know, each day is now that I've gotten older, I used to be I used to fret over it a lot now. But now that I've gotten older, I'm I'm much calmer about the whole thing. I just always go, it's just going to work out. Don't worry. We'll figure it out. You know, have you ever had any moments where you re really had to make a tough decision? You've got two great opportunities, but you can't do both. I, the I, 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 when I was younger, especially during the 80s and even in the early 90s, I was always presented with two or three um, conflicting projects at the same time. And I always made the wrong choice. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't like, that the way it always goes? Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I was uh, in 1986. I was. I did a movie in um, in the former Yugoslavia with with with, with Oliver Reed and and um, uh, not Keith Carradine, but David Carradine and uh, Bruce Davidson and um, a bunch of other people. And it was it was it was a terrible movie. It ended up being, but it was being made by the producers of. Babette's Feast. They were these Danish guys, and they owned all the rights to these books by a man named Sven Hassel, who was a former SS Danish SS member, and he was sort of the Louis L'Amour of Middle Europa, you know, and and would write about this SS Penal Panzer unit that, in in the movie, spoiler alert, we kill all our officers, you know. Okay. Um, but um, uh, but but it was I did that, and then on the day before I was to leave for Yugoslavia, and I actually knew one of the producers because he lived in a building as a close friend of mine, a fellow Bleacher Bums uh, author named uh, Dennis Paoli from the Organic Theater back in Chicago, lived in the same building as 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 uh, the uh, as Benny Corzin, who was the uh, the Danish producer. And so I couldn't very well back out of it, but I get a call from my agent and he goes, he goes, Keith, um, he says, Barry Levinson wants to hire you for uh, for uh, for Tin Men. And I go, I, I can't, I'm already, I, I'm already, I, I'm leaving in a plane in the morning. You know, I can't, I can't screw these people, you know? And so I did that. I did that movie instead of, um, instead of Tin Men. Oh. And then another time I did, uh, I did uh, Alex Cox's uh, um, Walker. It was called, it was shot in the former, it shot in Nicaragua uh, at the height of the uh, Contra War in 1987. But while I'm, when I came home, I had long, I had long scraggly red hair and a long scraggly red beard because that's what they wanted. They colored my hair for it, you know, and um, I, I, I got really sick and they sent me back to New York City. I was living then, you know, for like uh, for like two weeks. And um, and my agent calls me when I get back and he goes, Keith, uh, you, you uh, Oliver uh, wants to hire you for Wall Street and, and you, the, the party wants you to play. You can fit in the time that you're that you're there. And I said, oh, that's great. I'd love to do it. But can I? Can, can I, I, ha, I, I'm established in this other movie with long red hair and a scraggly red beard. Can you ask them if I, if, if I can have that look for, for, for wall street where it comes back? No, you can't. What? And so they, I couldn't, they couldn't put you in like a wig or a skull cap or something to cover it up. No, no, they wouldn't do it. Oh you know? man. <laughs> and uh, so, so James Spader played that part instead of me, you know, and you were, but, you were going to go do James Spader's part in wall street. In Wall Street, yeah, that because, was because of the, oh. because of the, but a further story is you know, and, and when I'm reading for this, I, I read for I, I read for um, I actually read for for Wall Street before I read for Walker. You know, <laughs> I got the Walker, I, and and I'm reading for for Wall Wall Street, and 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 Oliver Stone goes, 
he hears me read and he says, read this. He just gives me stuff. He gave me like six different characters and six different scenes to read. All right. And he goes, you're the best goddamn cold reader I've ever seen. You know, and, and I go, well, I guess that's a compliment. I don't know. You know, but he didn't hire me on the spot, you know. And then I I, I read for Walker and the way I got Walker is I, uh, Alex Cox was a director. and He was actually reading with me and he goes, I really want you to choke me. So I go, I choked him and I banged his head on the floor, you know, and and, and he goes, that's fucking great. I'm glad you're hired, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. So I did that. And then so then, you know, like six weeks later, after I'd been down in Nicaragua for a month, you know, I got I got the word, you know, and to hire to, to do Wall Street. But I, I couldn't. So cut to a year later, I'm reading for some movie and I had to, had to have a New Orleans accent for it. And Billy Hopkins was the uh, the casting director in New York. And he goes and I'm, and, I'm, and Oliver's looking at me like staring at me, you know, and I'm going, oh, boy. And 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 and, and I read and, and Billy goes. Oliver, wasn't that a great New Orleans accent that Keith had? And he goes, yeah, it was really great. He goes, you're the guy who turned me down on Wall Street, aren't you? What? And and he goes, and Billy goes, but but Oliver, Keith was doing a movie down in Nicaragua at the height of the contour. He goes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming in. Oh, so that comes in handy every now and then in terms of uh, intimidation. I love it. Oh yeah, yeah. Anyway, but that's that's though you asked me if I ever <laughs> read it anything, but many times. Many times I've. No, I, I'm, I'm into I, I'm I'm into you know all sorts of extreme sports. Uh, you know, uh, I jumped out of perfectly good airplanes. I used to rock climb, but I'm too old and my knees bad now, and wow. and I scuba dive. You know, and date actresses, you know, so that's at all extreme sports. You know, I, I can only imagine, um, uh, but it sounds like you've got plenty of experience there. Uh, enough. <laughs> well, uh, so you said that Oliver Stone said that uh, you were the best cold reader that he had ever um, imagined or, or encountered. And I uh, that's what he said then. I don't know what he'd say now, but, you know, <laughs> but, but, but of course, because time changes. But uh, I suppose that that would come in really handy as a video game voice actor or just an audiobook. Oh, it does. It does. It act- and I I'm, thank you for the segue, you know, but that was <laughs> but but that actually is because you don't usually see the scripts beforehand and you're right. you, you, you come in, you come in and you start reading and it's like you may, you, you know, in a day you might do 400 lines, you know, mm-hmm. in a four hour day, you know, um, sometimes you know, more like you probably would do like more like 240, 250, but it goes pretty fast. And they usually do one, two or three takes, you know, they'll have you do an A, B and a C. And then if they don't like it, they'll have you do it again, give you a little direction and then, then you move on, you know, and th- that's certainly the way it is with, uh, you know, like um, when you do the voiceover for it, not necessarily when you do the performance capture for it, you know, that's actually more like doing a movie, you know, or, or, or doing a play, you know, because uh, you're in tights with little dots all over you and you look fucking ridiculous. You know, you got a camera in front of your face like this too, like, that, that picks up everything. You know? I, I remember looking at myself going, God, I look like such a fucking dweeb. And then suddenly we... And then I, I step into the volume. This is when we were shooting Halo 4. And I look and I looked at the monitor and I'm this really fearsome giant 20 foot alien. And it was really and I'd move my arm and my arm would go. You know, it was really cool. Because you played the didact in didact, Halo yeah. 4. And uh, yeah. that's another thing, because I actually just oh. recently finished streaming Halo Wait. 4 a couple like a month uh-huh. ago. They have a lot of great cinematics in that. We shot that for a long time. I mean, that was that was a big, big project, you know. Well, one of the uh, reasons, um, uh, uh, one of the main reasons people are watching now is, of course, because of your role as Joshua Graham in the Honest Hearts DLC for Fallout New Vegas. And um, of course. It, one of the things that's just amazing about that is, of course, the writing. And you, you didn't have anything to do with that. But it's a combination of the amazing writing that goes into the character and the world building with the voice and the soul that you put into that character. And the fans of the Fallout series and, in, and Fallout New Vegas were so excited to actually finally see the face of Joshua Graham, mainly because during the primary plot of the game, he, his presence had been so hyped up, uh, like they had been talking about him. And finally, yeah, I, 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 you know, it's so funny that it's had such an impact that character. You know, I know there's a gentleman that uh, I, I talked to. I don't remember his name now. At some like maybe a year or so ago, who uh, who actually had made some small made a film about it and put it up on YouTube about Joshua Graham. 
and it's, it's had like one and a half million likes or it did at that time i don't know if it, what where it's at now but I, I wish i could remember his name maybe you know who he is i haven't heard of that uh of that, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't be surprised because he's such an iconic character uh, due to his you know relationship with the Legion, how he fell from grace, and how he sought redemption. Like he's got this amazing character growth throughout the story of the game. And I'm curious because um, you know we just talked about how you, when you sit down to do some voice acting, you don't have time to read through 400 pages of dialogue and you know all of these takes. So how much of his story? were you aware of how much of the plot of the game were you aware of when you were pitching? Very, very little, very little. I basically, they just told me as I went along what the situation was and, and here's how, you know, and, and then they'd say, can you read? And I'd read it and they go, Oh, we love that. Let's move on, you know, or, or can you do it like this? And that, that was essentially it. And I, I think I worked on it for about four or five days, you know, really so fun. All, all of the dialogue for Joshua Graham was recorded in only about four or five days. Yeah, as I recall, I, I may be wrong about that. It was like 10 or 11 years ago. Yeah, know. it was a while ago. But well, working with um, Bethesda, well, Bethesda published it. You worked with Obsidian, uh, presumably for that. Uh, did they give you any direction for Joshua Graham? Or did you pretty much have the voice established and you knew the kind of character that you wanted him to be? Well, you know, other than, I mean, they, they, they give you, when you, when you read for it, they give you some sample lines, mm -hmm. you know, when you audition for it. And then, um, and they give you a, a short, like, idea of what the story is, you know, um, and uh, that's all I had, you know, and I, I just did, I had been baptized twice, once in water, once in flame. I don't enjoy killing, but when done righteously, it's just a chore. I can't. <laughs> Oh, that's Latin. brilliant. Waging war against good people is bad for the soul. I, I, I guess um, I, you have to, uh, if people ask you to say those phrases, if you've got them readily available like that after, you know, 10 or 11 years of doing the game. Well, I get interviewed about, about Joshua Graham a lot, almost more than any other character that I've done. Which, yeah. which is amazing because you've been in all of these Hollywood films, all of, you know, years and decades worth of television, and of course, dozens and dozens of other games. And yet it's this character, this voice, this presence, this personality that you keep hearing about, that you keep coming back to. Do you, it, I mean, obviously we talked about the amazing writing that went into it, but do you have any suspicion as to why that might be, why he resonates with so many people? Um. No, I really don't. I wish I could say I did. You know, I mean, I, I would like to say something to the effect that, um, you know, maybe it has something to do with the fact that that he died, basically, and then came back and was reborn, you know, and lives every day in terrible agony and pain, you know, and yet somehow manages to carry on and, and, and complete what he sees as his mission, you know, and and does it with sort of with a flair, you know. He definitely has a unique flair. I mean, uh, our first introduction to the man is we're sitting there having a conversation and he is loading and inspecting every single pistol that he's giving to um, uh, his tribe. Uh, and that's like a 40 minute conversation. So that's a lot of guns that he's going through. It's pretty dramatic. Yeah. Well, I've had to fire a lot of guns in my day. I'm not a, I'm not a big, I mean, I believe in the, in the second amendment, don't get me wrong, but uh, I think the first amendment is the first amendment for a reason, you yeah. know? Well, and there are many other amendments or what is it? 28 now? 27? 28. I, I don't really know. I, I probably shouldn't be talking about that on camera because I'll get embarrassed about how little I know about the bill of rights. But speaking of uh, being familiar with guns, I remember hearing a story that you told another interviewer about your time with uh, Richard Mitchum on the Equalizer, and he did something interesting rel reloading a gun. Do you want to tell us that story? Well, actually, it wasn't reloading it. It was we were about to shoot a scene, you know, and uh, I have a couple stories about Mitchum. He actually was quite a character, yeah. you know. Um, he uh, he came on because Edward uh, Woodward, who was the Equalizer, who was, you know, Robert McCall, had had a severe heart attack um, in, our, in our interim between, we, we'd shot five or six episodes, because there was a, a writer's strike that was coming at the time. It was like 1988, I think. And um, so we, uh, we we took like, we'd shot five episodes of have it in the can in case of the writer's strike hit, which did. And then we came back and shot. But in the meantime, he had had a severe heart attack. So they brought uh, Mitchum in as a, to be the Northern control or whatever. But he was like going to be the star for a couple shows, you know. And 
Um, and but he was he was a really nice guy. And I remember we were up in in Harlem having uh, we we had been shooting all day. We spent six a.m. up uh, like one hundred and forty fifth and Broadway, and we went to this. Um, uh, really high end white tablecloth, linen napkins and stuff, a uh, soul food place. Uh, I think it was Sylvia's, but I'm not, not, I'm not quite certain. It was anyway, it was 144th and Broadway on 144th street. And we went in there and we all said, there was me and the director and, uh, uh, the DP and, uh, and, and Robert Mitchum, you know, and, uh, we're sitting at the, at, at the table and, and the waitress comes in, well, anybody want a drink? And it was noon, you know, and we were in the middle of shooting and everybody kind of looks around, you know, and Mitchum says, I'll take a uh, four extra dry vodka martinis, uh, save the ice for the poor man. And we all go, okay. And she goes, and she goes, all right, honey, do you, do you want me to bring them one at a time or, or he goes, no, ma'am, just, Bring them all together and line them up right in front of me. Oh my and God. so she did. And and I I got I was really brave and ordered a beer, you know. Um, and 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 he goes, she brings the four extra dry vodka martinis. He just does this boom, 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 boom. And didn't bat an eye, you know. Didn't affect him at all. No. I mean he was maybe a little slower the rest of the afternoon, but that was about it, you know. <laughs> And so we're shooting down at this, uh, in this, uh, it was an automobile museum, I think, you know, in the West Village. All these classic cars in there, you know, and we, there was a shootout that we were supposed to have in there. And so um, he and I are sitting around, you know, waiting to do it. And um, the uh, armor brings me my gun, you know, and he, he gives it to me and I check the chamber, you know, blah, blah, blah. He shows it to me. He gives it. He gives the gun to in, in deference to 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 Mitchum, and he doesn't open the chamber and show it to him. So Mitchum just takes the gun, points it at his feet, and empties the empties the, empties the magazine on the floor. Guy jumped. I jumped out of my seat. You know, it was. And he goes and he hands it back to him. He goes, "I guess you'll show me the chamber next time." <laughs> they just did things differently in that generation of uh, actor, didn't they? Wow. Yeah. That's hilarious. Well, um, I'm not sure because I, I couldn't find this, but was Fallout New Vegas your first time doing um, acting for a Bethesda published game? Or had you done some in the earlier Elder Scrolls? I'd done it Elder Scrolls prior to that. I'm prior to sure. that? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> because I know sure that you... Because I played Erander in Elder Scrolls and then a, a whole bunch... I was... They told me, like, I, I used to, like, do... I would, I would do thousands of lines, you know, and yeah. there were... I was like all, and they cut them up as all the dark elves, basically a rander, you know, but I was like all the dark elves. But I also have done, I did Argonians, Hyrcanians, uh, cat geests, cat geests. Um, uh, I, I was an old storyteller, you know, and in, in, in one of them, uh, I, I, I I just, I did, a, I did a lot. I just, and I just did some more for him a little while ago. And I was, uh, I can't remember the name of the character now, but he was kind of, he was a little light in his loafers. I, uh, that's all I remember. You know. <laughs> um, well, you also did. Not additional... that that's a bad thing, by the way. You know, not that that's a bad. No, no, no. Of course, but um, you also did additional voices for Fallout Four. Like you played some of the male ghouls in Fallout Four, didn't you? Okay, if you say I did, uh, I don't. Okay. Remember. I thought I saw that online. I don't know, but it, may, um... it might it might be true. I don't. I honestly don't. Like I said, it was. It was. I, I think it was like eleven years ago that I did it. You know, the, well, the well, Fallout. That's because... no. That was. Fallout 4 was uh, 2015. Well, then I suppose if you did the recording a couple of years before it came out. So, yeah, yeah. I suppose that would be 11 or so years ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, you keep I can coming... look at my IMDb, but I don't know, you know. <laughs> well, I, I see that you keep coming back to many Bethesda games um, from Skyrim to, you know, Rage 2, which you did some voice acting for. Uh, d is, is it because when you start with um, one of these games you develop a relationship with the people at the company and so they want to come back to you or is it sort of like every new gig is a new gig where you kind of have to start from scratch to audition for something yes every, yes yeah it, it's every every it's like I'm, I'm sure that I, you don't really have a relationship with these people because they're basically voices on the other end you know uh, 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 of the recording you hardly ever i may i may see a director you know, uh, and I'll see an engineer, you know, when I'm doing it uh, and very self every once in a while, you'll see a, there'll be a writer or a producer there, but very seldom, you know, they're usually the oftentimes uh, like when I'm working on, on Final Fantasy, they're, vo they're, they're voices that are in Tokyo, you know. Right. 
Right. I, I suppose I, that would, you know, know, would make it difficult to actually establish a relationship with them. Kind of. I mean, I, I mean, and there are people that I've worked with again and again, you know, uh, that, that, you know, are, and, and when they direct, you know, and you sort of have a relationship with them, but um, I don't think they're the people that are actually doing the hiring, hmm. you know, uh, they're just running the, the, the session, you know, and directing the session. But I could be wrong about that. You know, I, I, I as far as I know, you know, wow. on the, that that that's what uh, that's sort of the uh, the framework in terms of how it works is that you get hired by Activision or whomever, and then uh, or as you say Bethesda, you know, uh, and then uh, and then you you're brought into the session and the director directs you. Usually they're there. Sometimes sometimes they're not even there. There there are voices on on a headphone as well. You know, well, you, unless you're doing performance capture. If you're doing performance capture for something, then you're actually being directed as if it were a movie or a play, you know. <clears throat> so when you did L.A. Noir, you got to know the guys at Team Bondi uh, a little Bondi bit. Bondi pretty well, yeah. Pretty well. Yeah, I, I worked, you know, 20 some days on that, you know. That sounds like it was a really fun project, and I loved the game. It was. It was intense, too, you know. It was an intense project, but it was fun. We had a good time doing it, actually. <laughs> it sounds like it would have been a fun game to be part of. Well, they recently brought you back to do uh, the voice of Edgar Blackburn for Fallout 76, and I recognized the voice as soon as I heard him, which was a little funny because when you're playing this DLC for Fallout 76 and you're meeting these characters, you're not really supposed to know who the big villain of the DLC is first, but then we meet Blackburn and I recognize your voice and I'm like, okay, well, if they got him to do the voice for this character, he'll end up being the villain. And sure enough, later on, that's what happened. But I'm sorry that you were able to figure that out. I, <laughs> it's not your fault, but it's a, it, it was a recognizable uh, role. And I was wondering if um, when, when they pitched that to you, did they give you any different direction from some of the other voices that you had done in the Fallout universe? Or uh, did they just describe the character? Uh, so that they just could... described the character and I just read what I thought it was and they go, oh yeah, we like that. So and then they, and then they kept going on, you know. That was basically it. I I wish I could tell you wh what they did, but I frankly don't remember the, the session. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I do. I've done over a hundred games now, so I know, I know uh, right. It's 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 been a very long and storied career. Not that so. I don't love. I love doing them. I actually really enjoy them. You know, and sometimes they're really fun to do. You know, like uh, you know, Didact was really fun to do. You know. Uh, L.A. Noir was, uh, you know, Joshua Graham was was fun to do. But again, sometimes, you know, you're, you're working on it and, you know, you're working on three, four five games, you know, at a, at a time, right. you know, and not out in each session. But like in, you know, in a given month, it used to be that I would work on several different games every month, you know, and, you know, they would be spaced out, but it would be, you know, sometimes that you get them confused in your head. <laughs> yeah, I can, I'm sure I would as well. Yeah. Well, um, I've heard this story before uh, about how you got into acting, but I think uh, the viewers right now would love to hear that as well because it's sort of, uh, well, almost a, well, a serendipitous way that you sort of walked into your acting career. Yeah, I, uh, well, I was 19 and I had, I, I'd been a big, I, I had done a lot of acting in high school and I, the, the high schools that I went to both had, uh, extensive theater programs and I would have been an athlete but I was really little when it started high school I didn't grow till the end of my sophomore year you know I'd been an athlete in middle school I was a little league all-star all that sort of bullshit you know and mm -hmm. and I was actually pretty good at it but I was really little and I so I wasn't even allowed to, to play football you they know. didn't let you play just because you were little you had to be 115 pounds to play ah, you know I, I didn't get 115 pounds until the end of my sophomore year you know so um, anyway, safety I, I, first, right? Yeah, I, well, they didn't want me to get killed, and frankly, I didn't want to get killed either. You know, because there were I, I, my youngest son, he had a similar issue. You know, he was a really, he was a great, he was an all-star baseball player. You know, uh, and a tournament player for years. You know, and then when he got to high school, he was five foot tall, and he was playing with people that were six foot five. You know, so it was, and he didn't grow to the his sophomore year either. So he kind of dropped out of sports and kind of regrets it now but you know he, he had a he, he's doing fine you know that's good yeah you know, um you know he, he works on excess hollywood right now so oh. you know, he's a, head of their graphics department you know so awesome well congratulations to him yeah and my older boy jack works on uh csi vegas and he just got made a member of the dga so he's directing now hey that's awesome you must be really Inserts. proud i am i'm very proud of both of them you know um 
But what was it? What was I? What was I saying to you? Oh, how I got into show business, right? Well, as I said, I was in you know high school, and I won the Senior Dramatics Award, and I won the Best Actor two years in a row in my the public school I went to, you know, and um, my junior and senior year, and uh, I was having a whole lot of fun, and um, one day I, I but I and I had this I had a scholarship to Trinity University uh, to the theater department there. And I was went a semester and I came back home and I was working uh, for construction uh, materials. And uh, I was a civil engineering firm as a one of their field and lab technicians that a friend of mine's stepfather owned. And I had a, I, I actually enjoyed the job. But one night I went to see um, Death of a Salesman at Arlington Park Theater in Arlington Heights, Illinois, uh, with uh, Jack Warden and uh I was so moved. I went with the, one of my drama teachers and with my sister and with a buddy of mine and, uh, and, and drove in my company car and, uh, and we watched this and I, and, and I just was so overwhelmed with, I don't want to become Biff or Hap that I said, I've got it. And this voice goes off inside of me. If you're going to go, you have to go now. It was like, I had, I, and, and I, I, I dropped them all off. It was seven o'clock at night. Cause it had been like a late m matinee, you know, um, and I drove down to where I'd seen a great play the year before called Poe while I was still in high school, uh, and which was but done by the Organic Theater of Chicago, Stuart Gordon, whom you may know from um, Reanimator fame, you know, the film Reanimator. He directed that, but he was the artistic director at this theater company. And it, it was the most stunning thing I'd ever seen, this uh, Poe, this version of Poe about Edgar Allan Poe. And um, I just I went, I want to go be I want to work with them. You know, and so I drove down and I just I didn't even know where I was going. And I and I ended up parking in this rubble strewn lot. And I, I, I was off Lincoln Avenue and, and Webster in Chicago. And I just started walking. And I walked to where the organic theater was at the body politic. And I'm standing in front of the of the theater. And just then the, the show started letting out. And I go, I woke up. It was like I woke up out of a trance or a dream. I go, oh, my God, how did I get here? And I like leaned against a light pole in front of it and started banging my head against it going i've got to stop smoking pot i just have got to stop <laughs> you know? and and um because back then i was kind of a johnny marijuana seed mm -hmm. and uh, not anymore you know but uh maybe i will if i get farther out of my dotage you know <laughs> now that i'm at my biblical three score and ten i'm i'm in overtime now you know um but and I and I, I have this tap on my shoulder and I turn around and I look and and I didn't and then I look down and there's this little guy he's about six inches shorter than me you know and I'm and he's an older actor you know not old old but for me he was twenty six you know and I was nineteen right and 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 he goes are you okay he says can, can I help you and I says ah yeah I'm 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 okay I'm okay he says can I help you are you looking for somebody I go yeah I am he goes uh well, who and I go uh. He goes, uh, Stuart Gordon? Uh, no, I don't know him. He goes, Lenny Kleinfeld, who had written it, you know, this play Warp, you know, uh, which went to Broadway, by the way, and bombed. Um, but, uh, and I go, mm, no, no. And he goes, Zazu Pitts? And I go, yeah, that's the one. Take me in to see her. And he goes, okay. <laughs> so we walk into this room and it's what's called the rug room. It was like the sort of, it was the uh, just outside the green room in the, at the theater there at the Body Politic. And um, it was off to the side of the main lobby. And he stops and he turns around him and all this multicolored carpeting, floor, ceiling, and walls. And he turns and he goes to me, uh, you know, Zazu Pitts isn't here. And I go, yeah, I kind of figured that. He goes, my name's Bill Norris. What's yours? I go, Keith Starbica. And he goes, I'm just going to call you Keith. Do you mind? And, and I go, okay. And he's, he's kind of looking, looking me over and he goes, he says, uh, what, what do you, what, what, what do you, what do you want? What do you, what, what are you doing? What do you, what do you, what do you hear? And I go, well, I, 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 you know, I, I, I was involved in the theater, you know, and I'm, I'm home from the summer for college. And I, 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 I would like, uh, I just wanted to volunteer somewhere and work, you know, at a, at a theater company. And, and I really liked the work I saw. I go at this theater. He goes, well, what'd you see? I said, Poe. And he goes, Oh, you, you, you saw me. I go, and Poe, I go, I, I don't know. I, I saw a guy who was a lot taller. Oh, you saw Richard do it. You didn't see me. I go, but yeah, I'm sure you were great. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and, and then he goes, um, 
He says, he said, then some friends of mine, he says, well, you know what play we're doing now? I go, it's called, uh, he says, it's called Warp. I go, oh yeah, some buddies of mine, they saw it and they said that this little guy was running around like Woody Allen and he was, and he was, you know, knocking off, you know, villains in the, in the fourth dimension in the universe, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and, the, and it was really fun. It was rock and roll and, and, and all sorts of special effects and really funny and, and exciting and great fights and stunts and leaps. And he goes, yeah, he says, I actually was Lord Cumulus back then, you know, but, uh, but, cause I, but, I'm now I'm just Cymax, who is a, the the monkey, which was who was a great part, by the way. Um, and this guy is a terrific actor. He, he passed away last November, unfortunately. Um, a terrific, lovely man, um, William J. Norris. And um, and he goes, uh, and he's looking me over. He goes, so have you ever acted before? And I had really long blonde hair at the time, and I was buff. I was cut you know i was i was running four to six miles a day i'd swim a thousand yards you know i and and i just i just was and i was working outdoors in, in, uh, for a construction firm you know and so i was in really good shape and he goes have you ever acted before i said oh yeah yeah and i don't my you know i did a lot you know in, in com college community and, and and high school and he goes i got someone i want you to meet so he goes to the door, he knocks on the door of the green room, the green room, which actually had a green door open and this huge cloud of marijuana smoke comes out and Stuart Gordon comes out and he looks like Jerry Garcia, you know, uh, when he was younger. And, um, and, and, he, and he looks at Norris and he looks at me and he looks back at Norris and like, he's going like, what the fuck are you bringing your tricks in for me to, to meet me for? You know? and, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and, and, and Bill goes, uh, Stuart Gordon, this is Keith. I can't pronounce his last name. Keith wants to audition for ro the role of Lord Cumulus in Warp. And he goes, and Stuart looks at me, he goes, far out. Come back tomorrow night with a prepared two minute Shakespearean reading. And he, and he turns up and he turns around and he goes, oh, and make it something militant. And, and, and he walks away and, and, and Bill goes, it's all yours now, Bubala, and walks away. And I, it's a long story. I got hired, but John Hurd was doing the part. The he's passed away four years ago, John, five years ago now. And um, was that was one the of my uh, that was he, he played the father in Home Alone, didn't he? He was the father in Home Alone. Yeah, that was one of his major things. Um, uh, many, he did many, many. He won five Obie Awards, you know, oh. back in seventies and eighties. You know, um. um and he was it was like going with a god anywhere you know uh, being with him but um you know he, he treated me as if i were his younger brother which i kind of was you know and <laughs> but he decided what well, i got hired and then john decided to, uh, to not leave because the show was going to broadway and then they found out i was only 19 so they basically fired me but said i could stay and be in the in the and i could stay in the theater and and uh, and and be the understudy and do all the shit work but so because you were I said, only 19 that's why Pretty much, I guess. So because John was, you know, I don't know, John was 26 and he was a, you know, a seasoned, a seasoned actor, you know. Um, and so, but I, and I was, I, you know what, I went, this is my shot. I'm going to stay. And I did. And I worked at the organic for the next six years, you know. Wow. Yeah. Well, and you believe, and that of course was your intro. And from that, you were able to um, get. But I, we moved to New York with an organic play that we wrote uh, mm -hmm. called Bleacher Bums. Uh, which uh, was a, a big critical success and was a big commercial success and and, and, sh and critical success success in in Chicago. But it was a, it was a, it was a critical success in New York. But they kind of didn't get it because it was a real Chicago play. But we ran it for ten weeks there at the American, you know, and down at the Performing Garage, you know. Uh, so it was it was fun, and I decided to stay, you know, because I had my heart broken by a beautiful young woman who just was just just wasn't the same for her, you know, couldn't go back. And I, and I was going to the University of Chicago at the time too, you know, and they were, my professors were pretty impressed with me because I was actually doing what they were teaching me. I we were writing play, they, you know, we were, I was writing plays and helping produce them and, and, and acting and performing in them. And while I was going to, to college, you know, and they actually, they actually made a, a, a sort of a playwriting unit for me, which they had never done before, you know, and I, I was able to take like graduate Ibsen courses and stuff, you know, and it was, it was a graduate Shakespeare, you know, and Shaw, you know, mm -hmm. Joyce, but um, they wanted me to come back. And of course, in fact, my, my, my mentor at the university of Chicago, Francis Xavier Kinahan, great guy. He uh, tried to, he actually drove me back from New York to, to Chicago. Uh, like at the end of the, of the, of the uh, uh, American place run, oh, uh, Bleacher. Wow. And because he lived in Bay, his parents lived in Bayonne, he was visiting them. So he, I drove back with him, but I told him I, I'm not, 
I'm not going back. This is what I want to do. And I've got agents now and I just want to see what the hell is going to happen, you know? So I never got my degree, unfortunately, but I have had a career. And that's sometimes you just got it. Sometimes when the brass ring comes around, you just got to grab it, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. But I mean, you still at least made all of those memories at school and you had that experience. I did, you know, and it was a, it was a great school to go to. I'm very proud of the fact I went there. Mm -hmm. I think I still owe them. <laughs> oh, no, really? <laughs> I actually got to go for a couple quarters and basically for free, which I, I when I asked for a transcript once, I go, hey, I'm missing a couple quarters here, you know, and it turned out I, I'd never really been registered the last two quarters I oh, was there. Oh, wow. But whatever, you know. <laughs> I'm sure they're not keeping the books on that. Hopefully not. Probably not. Hopefully not. You know. Well, uh, aside from the, the amazing way that you got into this uh, this field of work, what would you say was one of the most lucky, you know, lightning strike sort of roles that you ended up getting? Well, I mean, the lightning strike was getting into you know uh, the organic theater. That was that was the the keystone to it all because I worked right. with really talented people like John. And uh, Richard Fire and uh, Dennis Franz and Joe Mantegna. I'm going to drop a lot of names here. Andre De Shields, you know, uh, Stuart Gordon, you know. I mean, it was just, you know, Mamet was a, a writer that uh, often, you know, uh, would have his stuff tried out at our place, you know. Um, in fact, the first reading of, uh, of uh, oh, shit. What's the one that's set in the, oh, God, I can't think of what it is now. It's what happens when you get old. Uh, it happens to me too. So, yeah, uh, it's part of life. Yeah, it's part of life. It's it's set it's set in a like a like a pawn shop, you know. And then Al Pacino did it on Broadway with the uh, J.J. Johnson. Uh, it, Joe, but Joe Mantegna did did the reading. I remember seeing it, watching it. Uh, sorry, it's done constantly. It's one of the, American Buffalo. That's it. Sorry, oh. American Buffalo. Great. Sorry, couldn't think of it. <laughs> It's, it's it's got great characters great dialogue you know great situation but i've always even when i first saw it you know and it, my 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 criticism was this play doesn't end it just stops you know? <laughs> well okay so uh... but, but 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 okay i can uh, some, my favorite parts that i've ever done uh well like uh uh, well, in Missing, I got to I got to work with the, the wonderful Costa Gavras, you know, and I got to work with Jack Lemon and Sissy Spacek, oh, you wow. know, uh, and, and we were in Mexico City and it was, uh, it was the second movie I ever did. The first movie I ever did was called Simon. It was Marshall Brickman wrote and directed it and it was with uh, uh, Alan, Ar uh, Alan Arkin, you know, and I played his graduate research assistant at, um, and in that movie. I had one scene, but. It would, I ended up getting 11 days of shooting out of it because the leading lady, uh, Judy Grobert, uh, when we showed up, she had stuck, she put her contact lenses in with cleaning solution instead of wetting solution. And so was we had to show up every day for 11 days until her eyes finally healed, you know, from uh, having done what she did, you know. I, but, I but, 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 you know, I was a young, broke, off, off-Broadway actor, you know, and uh, I was happy to have that 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 kind of gig, you know. Um, and then I got to do Missing, which was Jack Lemon was just the most wonderful man. He would sit there and he'd hang out in the bar and talk to everybody. He, he was he would buy people drinks. They'd buy him drinks. And every day on the set, you know, when we were shooting after everything was set, we we're all ready to go. And all the all the all the, the cameras and lights are set and the, we're about ready to roll. He would go like this. It's magic. <laughs> and he meant it. And that was he was just that it's magic. Oh, wow. Yeah. But then uh, I got to do Doonesbury uh, and work with Gary Trudeau, who's a, a genius, you know, and a really nice guy. Yeah. Uh, we got to work from, we went, started with 17 songs that he and Liz Suedo said he'd written the lyrics for and Liz had done the music. And and uh, then we just constructed uh, a, uh, a full-length musical out of it, you know, in uh, three and a half months in a workshop. At 890 Broadway, and then uh, it was on Broadway. It ran 144 performances, you know, which isn't a big one, but it's like you know, it broke my heart when it closed. I I, I could I never was a never was able to say my last line. I couldn't get it out. <laughs> oh no! Why? 
Why couldn't you get? I don't know. I just got all. I just got all choked up. Oh. I couldn't... <laughs> well, but then uh, you know, and being in the Equalizer was just. I was. A, it's a one shot deal. Originally, I was like hired, you know, by uh, the director Richard Compton, um, uh, who then directed many of them, you know, afterwards, and and me and other. He became a good friend of mine, as did Edward, you know. But um, I just was hired for one episode, and then halfway through you know the week of shooting uh edward you know i was brought i was summoned to his his trailer and he just sat and we just sat and talked for like an hour and i guess he must have decided he liked me so i suddenly was appearing uh, in episode after episode and they offered me a contract the the second season oh know? wow so it was i had fun in that it was just a really that that to me was like a bolt out of nowhere you know yeah yeah. Well, if that was a bolt out of nowhere, was there ever a role that you felt like you had to really work for to get? Not necessarily to work for to perform, but it, it was something you wanted and you aimed for it and you fought for it and you got it. No. No. I, 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 no. <laughs> okay. That's, that's all no, right. I, well, I mean, my, well, Chaz Grayson, I'll, I'll say Chaz Grayson. You know, in prop, uh, you know, I, I really, I was originally, again, I, I was only hired for the, uh, for the, uh, for the pilot. And then uh, they, they actually dropped two characters as regulars and, and hired me to become a regular after the pilot, you know, and uh, it was just, that, that was a really fun project. Mm. David Greenwald and John McNamara are terrific writers and I love them both and wish I worked with them more, you know, um, I did, but Greenwald then hired me to be a uh, Holtz and, um, and, uh, and that was sort of out of the blue. He just called me up. He goes, would you come and do this for me? And I go, do what? And he goes, well, be, I want, we need somebody to be this uh, 17th century, you know, 18th century uh, English vampire hunter. Although we weren't sure at the time it was going to be, Eng what, what his accent was going to be. You know, we went through a bunch of, we tried Dutch and German and Ru Eastern European, Russian, you know, and, fin and finally we settled on just sort of standard, you know, received pronunciation, you know even though he was from Yorkshire, um, but uh, for to play Holtz and Angel, you know, and that was really, I got, we got to be the third season villain. And that was one of my favorite parts I've ever done. I got to like, you know, uh, ride horses and shoot crossbows and set people <laughs> on fire, you know, stake people had sword fights, you know, it was, that was really fun, you know? And uh, I, I actually got, um, I just, I, and I got along with the cast members really well. And, and and I've I've had you know I had the great fortune good fortune to after it ended uh, to go go once or twice a year to to England to do fan conventions with uh, Star Fury you know, conventions you know and uh, for the Angel Buffy stuff and now they bring me for another part I loved for Donatello and Supernatural you know which uh, I got because I uh, I I'd actually known Eugenie Ross Lemming in in. Uh, and um, was one of the writers and produ executive producers of uh, the last five years of um, of, of, of uh, Supernatural. Mm -hmm. uh, and she and I, we, I knew I knew her in in in, uh, in, in, in Chicago, but she was she was, she was above my pay grade in terms of dating, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, and but she was really good friends with a really good friend of mine. And when this friend of ours, mutual really good friend, passed away. In 2015, we both gave eulogies at her memorial. And after I gave my eulogy, which was pretty funny and kind of moving, hopefully, uh, Eugenie turns to me and he goes, I'm putting you in my fucking TV show. <laughs> and so that's how I got into Supernatural. That's awesome. You know. Wow. From a eulogy, because he was impressed by your eulogy. Well, she'd known me too for like, you know, almost 40 years at that right. point. You know, but... Um, Oh, actually over 40 years uh, uh but but she and i were never tight you know we were we knew each other but you know but we became much closer after that you know and her husband bobby singer who was the executive producer and showrunner of uh, supernatural actually wanted to hire me for midnight caller back in um in 1989 for, to do the pilot and um but my agent at the time um said uh he said no no stay with the equalizer it's going to have several more seasons and you're going to get a you will, we will redo the contract the equalizer is a really popular show you should stay with it and i go okay so i did you know and um of course the equalizer then got canceled that summer oh. you know <laughs> oh, well that supposedly was in retaliation 
for um, Universal raising the licensing fee for Murder, She Wrote. And so in retaliation, CBS canceled The Equalizer and I think Spencer for Hire at the same time because they were both Universal shows. All three were Universal shows. But I, th again, all those politics are above my pay grade. Those are just rumors that I'm I'm spreading and gossip. <laughs> well, you mentioned um, accents, and I have found um, doing accents is incredibly difficult. But for your role on Angel, you went through all of these different accents. Do you have to do research and listen to it, or do you find yourself able to Sometimes. slip into an accent some, pretty easily? You know, some some accents I can slip into a lot of. I get slipped into a lot of different accents pretty easily, you know, but uh, it just, it, it, like I do audio books, you know, a lot of them. I've done like probably 150 audio books and um, I do all the, you know, you do all the voices in them. And I, I actually find it kind of fun to do them, you know, uh, because you can do all these accents and you have to be able to do them. And yeah, if, if I have it written in front of me, I can pretty much slip in and out of accent, accent to accent, you know, See, that's and a skill. That the hardest one. Be. The hardest ones are South African, South African. Uh, you know, and everything's tin, and I, I tend to do this. You know, uh, but and uh, or or Dutch. You know, which is really, really uh, everything's hot, 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 hot back here. Yeah. Uh, but I was I was in I was in I had the pleasure of being in Amsterdam with the Organic Theater for uh, three and a half months in 1975. Oh, we were wow. A, a theater there called the Mickery. A man named Richard Tenkate used to bring theater companies in from all over the world and went broke doing it. And then the Dutch government, after he went broke, made him did this whole thing with him, and he suddenly became a Dutch government functionary, bringing in theater companies from all over the world. And we were we went twice the organic. I only went once. We did a bloody best, which was called Ein Piratenstück, you know, which was a, a pirate play, and it was really fun. And then, uh, uh, but I didn't, I didn't get to go on that one. And, uh, uh, and then I did Adventures of Huckleberry Finn there, you know, for three and a half months. And we did it for two weeks in London too, you know. Wow. So toured all over Holland. So I got, you know, I don't know. I guess I made a good choice, you know, not going back to the University of Chicago, though, as I said. <laughs> I, but, I'd um, say you did. I mean, there are probably many people who have graduated who have not seen quite as much of the success that you have. So. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes which, when you got to go, you just you got to go. Yep. You sometimes know. the opportunity. You, gotta, you just got to be lucky enough to to recognize it. As Machiavelli, Machiavelli said in the discourses, he said that uh, that uh, a good prince must have two things: fortune and preparation. True. You can have all the good. You can have all the good luck in the world if you're not prepared to take advantage of it. It doesn't do any any good. Right. And likewise, if you can be prepared to the nth degree, but you never have that stroke of good luck. Or recognize it when it happens. It doesn't happen either. Well, we're at uh, eleven thousand four hundred and thirty-seven on the donations for St. Jude's. Thanks to everybody watching right now who keep those donations rolling in. Yeah, if you want to donate, you can find a link in the description, and there's one pinned at the top of the chat. Um, really appreciate everybody contributing to this wonderful charity during this broadcast. Um, Keith, I uh, was curious about. Didn't Danny Thomas used to do this? Wasn't this used to be his 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 big thing? Who? Danny Thomas. Danny Thomas. I don't think I'm familiar. You don't. You never. You <laughs> make make room for Daddy. The Danny Thomas show. You know, Marlo Thomas was his daughter. You know. I I, I wish I was. I, I don't know a lot about. It was that girl? It's old TV, but I, I I used to watch it as a kid. You know, it was in the early '60s, late '50s. Danny Thomas was a big star, and he used to do a huge marathon for St. Jude's. You know. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that's cool. I didn't know that, but yeah, this yeah. this is actually my second. I'm pretty movie. sure. I mean, you know, St. Jude's may want to, uh, you know, correct me on that, but I'm I, I'm pretty sure that's that's who did it. You know. Well, I mean, I'm sure your memory is correct, and I, I we can look it up later. But this is my second year uh, 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 doing a charity with them for Fallout for Hope, and it's just an absolute honor. And I'm so glad that you're able to join us for this one. I had a question about if you had any stories from your time playing Adam Engel in Argo. Well, you know, <laughs> well, I do have a story from that of how I got into it. I, um, back in 1986, I, um, uh, well, I get a call from my agent, you know, and it says, um, they, they want you to come in and read for, uh, Ben Affleck's new movie. You know, it's a smallish part, but I go, okay, you know, uh, but could you ask Ben if he remembers me and if he needs me to come in? 
And and they go, what do you mean? I go, well, back in 1986, he and I did an ABC after school special called Wanted the Perfect Guy that Milton Justice produced. And um, uh, God, what's her name? Madeline Kahn played Ben's mother in it. And Ben and this and this young girl, uh, I don't remember her what her name was. She was a couple. He was, ben was like twelve years old at the time, and um, and, and it, they were wanted wanted the perfect guy. And I, oddly enough, was the perfect guy, and, and that was brought in for their you know their mom to date Madeline Kahn to date, and it won an an, an, an Emmy an after school special oh, you know wow. the, uh, the the show. And uh, uh, but I just said just ask Ben if if I need to come in and if he remembers me, you know and I. And, and if I need to come in and, you know, and my agent goes, Oh, okay. And, um, I didn't hear anything for two weeks. So I got, well, Ben just went, fuck you. You know, uh, who, is, who do you think he is? Two weeks later, I said, well, they offer you, they're offering you the part, you know, and it was a small part. It was like three or four scenes, you know? And, and then, um, I go to the, then I, I go, really? Go, yeah. Well, I said, I guess that worked. And I, you know, so I get called in to do a table read of the, of the piece with all these other actors, you know, and, at Ben's office in Brentwood. And he goes, first of all, he goes, I want you guys to all understand, none of you, you're all hired. You're not, nobody's getting fired, you know, but we just want to read through the, the script, you know? And so I read through the script and I read a couple different parts, you know, and, and, um, and he thanked everybody. We got fed and then went away. And I get a call from my agent the next week. Well, um, they bumped up your part now. So it went from, you know, a one or two day part to a couple of weeks, you know? So it was, uh, so I got to I got to play, you know, I was I was Brian Cranston's assistant, you know, basically I was the deputy chief of operations. And, you know, Brian couldn't have been a nicer man, honestly, he just was a, a lovely man. But I actually kind of knew him from um, from uh, um, coaching baseball at Beeman Park in, in Studio City. You know, it was rec, rec baseball, you know, uh, literally, wow. not literally, but it was rec baseball. Uh, later on, I, I moved to Sherman Oaks Little League and I helped actually help still run Sherman, Sherman Oaks Little League in, in, in Sherman Oaks, you know, although my children are now long gone from there, you know. Right, right. <laughs> but I have buddies who still have younger children and, uh, you know, younger siblings young, and second families. So I'm I'm still there. I'm sort of the coach for the coaches, you know. Well, did uh, Ben Affleck eventually remember you did did you ever find oh yeah him? no he definitely remembered me yeah okay. he did and and he had and he did a really lovely thing once we uh uh when, once the movie was shot and in the can he invited me and a couple of other of the, of the the sort of medium role actors uh it, to his home he was still with jennifer at the time to uh to, to screen the play and we had pizza and sushi and then discussed the play for two and a half hours afterwards over oh, beer wow. and wine and and pizza and it was really it was and he just wanted to know what we thought you know and he had been he he knew that i'd been in missing you know and there was actually a couple homages in there to uh to to to, to uh missing you know in terms of shots you know that he wanted to know how, how they worked and i thought they did you know and i thought he did a good job of 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 sort of getting the suspense especially at the end you know well that's did really nice he seems uh seems like a nice guy i he couldn't have been nicer to me you know that's all i can tell you all right. Um, I remember uh, reading that you can you sometimes still get nervous for roles. Is that true? Always. Always. I get nervous. I get nervous when I make dinner for my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Performance anxiety is real, you yeah. know, and some people, you know, cope with it in different ways. I, I used to often throw up before. Uh, uh, like an invited dress, uh, you know, in the theater, an invited dress or a, a first preview or an opening night, you know. And once I did that, I'd be fine. But up until then, it was just would sort of build up, you know, toward oh my god. Oh. But you learn how to cope with it after 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 a while, you know. Um, but I, there are people who don't, you know. And it's like, uh, you know, like big performers like Prince. I mean, he. I think one of the reasons why so many of them die of alcoholism or drug abuse is because of performance anxiety, you know. Because it's getting up for it, you know, and overcoming the fear, and then 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 coming down and crashing afterwards. I mean, it's a big thing. I, I you know, you'd co I I'd come down on a Saturday night after you know doing two performances, you know, of whatever something, you know, whether it was Broadway, off Broadway, or wherever, you know, and I, I you'd get off at ten thirty at night, and you'd you'd go and you'd have dinner somewhere late, you know, and then you'd and you'd drink, and basically you'd stay up till six thirty in the morning because you were just wired, you know. Wow. Well, if, if you coped with it, 
by vomiting when you were younger. <laughs> how, how do you cope with it now? Is it sort of you've gotten so used to it that you just power through it? or do you, I, I there... kind of power through it. I just use it to focus my energy. You know, it's, okay. I, 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 what I say, it's, 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 it's the universe's way of, of getting you to focus your energy. You know, that sort of performance anxiety, that fear of failure, that fear of flopping, you know. Well, you mentioned that you uh, you taught uh, ba uh, baseball and you met Brian Cranston and, and worked with him doing that. But it seems like you also uh, taught teaching classes as well. You were an adjunct professor or are you still? I still am. You still I are? I still am. Uh, tell yeah, me about Woodbury. That. Well, I, I, I teach my I, I'm an I teach I'm an adjunct professor in the uh, film department, which means basically, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, like you come in and out. I, yeah, I come in and out, you know, yeah. but I, 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 I usually do fall semester there. I've done it for the past five years, but this year I'm teaching in the spring and I, I teach what's called uh, acting for writers and directors because most young writers and directors, in fact, some older ones have no fucking idea what a, an actor does, you know? <laughs> and so what I do is I basically try to give them a vocabulary. I, 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 I have four different acting teachers that I literally teach them about. You know, uh, Stanislavski, Uta Hagen, uh, a guy named Michael Shirtliff, who wrote the best, most practical book on on uh, acting I've ever read called Audition, you know, and um, and then Michael Chekhov, who was Anton Chekhov's nephew uh, and uh, wrote a book called Psy The Psychological Gesture, where it's like if you way you use your hand, you know, can just or, or how you put your body can make the moment you know and it's a very important thing to know and um, and so i they get quizzes on those and then but they also have to do they have a midterm scene and a final scene and it has to be memorized they have to have props costumes you know and they use found material from the studio that we work in you know to uh to uh and they have to act and it has to all be memorized you know, otherwise they get 10 points off and that's a quarter of their grade each of those you know uh things but they they get it you know i think you know I've only had one student, one, one student hate me in the five years I've been, you know, maybe all of them hate me. I don't know. But <laughs> the dean keeps telling me, he says, the kids just fucking love you. You know, and I go, OK, well. <laughs> Do you think, uh, would you say that uh, memorization even today uh, is just as important as it was before? Absolutely. 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 Can you tell Absolutely. the difference between someone who comes prepared, uh, having something memorized and that they've practiced to someone who's just got talent? but they're just reading off the page. Um, I, I think that until you get it inside your system, actually in your body, mm -hmm. in your mind, you know, where you actually own it wholly, you know, which is how you, you memorize it, um, that you, 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 you don't have the character until you do that. You know, I mean, although, you know, then I, I do a lot of voiceover work, which most of it isn't memorized. You know, you have to read it, but I'm, as Oliver Stone said, I'm, I'm a really good cold reader. Yeah. Not everybody has that ability, you know. Right. Well, um, so I'm curious about any projects that you're working on now. Um, uh, we had a, a schedule for earlier, and you were working on an audio book at that time, so now we're doing it. Now, are you still doing lots of audio books? Are there other yeah. projects that you're involved in? Oh, yeah. No, I got a lot of audio books, and there, there are a couple different... Uh, a couple different video games I'm working on that I'm actually not at liberty to talk about. Okay. Because they signed NDAs for everything, you know. Um, but um, I, I did, I just did a little, I did a Santa slasher film that was last weekend. It's just a short, short film that they're trying to sell. And it's actually pretty, pretty fun. A Santa you know? slasher film. Yeah. Well, kind of like, you know, it's called uh, Jingle Hell, actually, you know. It's got a ring to it. Had a ring to it, you know. <laughs> well, like uh, the what, what's the what's his name? Uh, David Harbor in um, in in Violent Night, you know that that's just come out. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I saw the previews for that. Yeah, I have. I haven't seen it. I'm I'm not a big I'm not a big horror film guy. You know, I, I prefer comedies myself or epic adventures. I'm more of a Lord of the Rings guy. You know. Oh my God. So, same here. I mean, when it comes to games, I like a good horror game just because those are a lot of fun for the reactions on camera. Well, Dead Space was pretty scary. That was one of the scariest things ever. You know, I missed Dead Space. Every time I play a horror game, my community will talk to me about having played Dead Space. And I was working in San Francisco at the time when Dead Space came out and I was so busy with work that I, I didn't get a chance to play it. But now they're coming out with a remastered version that I'm looking forward to finally getting my, 
my feet into. But I'm, I've been playing Callisto Protocol in the meantime, which is supposed to be like a spiritual within within the spirit of the Dead Space franchise. But I've been enjoying it so far. Did you play Dead Space when it came out? No, I, I, I never play the games. I once tried to play them. I was trying to play Call of Duty once with my kids. And before I could figure out which screen I was, I was dead. You know, so <laughs> I just I, I enjoy doing them. But I, I my, my 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 sons, they play it all the time. You know, and my nephews and stuff, you know, they're 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 just fanatics. Like I used to hear come out of the rooms. I just killed dad. And I'm so happy that I can help them get out their Oedipal urges that way. You know, so um, they don't actually kill me, you know. Right. Better kill you on screen, kill you exactly. in game than in life. Right? Right. So you'll take right. that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I have very happily, you know, right. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, so you, uh, uh, I was curious how you transitioned, or not necessarily transitioned, but um, moved into um, voice acting, because you started out in theater and worked in film, but it's when, when was it that you started to uh, do voice acting for video games and audio books? Was that later, well, or did you jump right in? No, it was a little, well, actually, early on, when I was still in Chicago, a man named uh, Yuri Ratsov, I Ira Rasovsky was his name, he was a writer and director, and I did a bunch of uh, radio plays for him back mm. in the early, one of them, which I played John Savage in his version of Brave New World, and um, wow. so I, I, I did a bunch of that, you know, in, in Chicago when I was, you know, uh, working at the Organic and going to the University of Chicago for those six years i did a lot of stuff for for yuri and um or ira as people would call him but then when i moved to new york um you know and i had an agent and they they started sending me out for commercials and and then i started doing some commercial voiceover stuff um but I, it turned out that one of the neighbors in my building that i lived in in um in in the upper west side um ran symphony space his name um Oh, Jesus. See, this is what happens. Uh, <laughs> it's always hard with the names. I mean, even I have. You no, know, I can picture him right now, but I can't. But he was just a great man. He, he, he died about three years ago. Um, God, I can't believe I can't remember his name right now. It's a, you, you, I, can remember his I can remember his partner's name, Alan Miller, you know, uh, who ran the music side of Symphony Space on the Upper West Side. And I just, I, I, I'm ashamed that I can't remember. I mean, but he was, he was a big patron of mine, and and he, he was uh, one of my upstairs neighbors. I had like the basement apartment, you know, and I used to have wild parties all the time, and he would complain about me. But we became friends, you know, <laughs> and um, and he one day he invited me to do. He used to do um, these things called the Bloomsday readings, you know, uh, and it was on every day they read uh, James Joyce's Ulysses from beginning to end. Uh, and in the 24 hour period uh, of June, June the 16th, uh, you know, and I, I did some of those. And then he invited me to do what I think called selected shorts. Isaiah, Isaiah Shepherd, that was his name. Sorry. Okay. And great, great, wonderful man. Got there in the and end. You got there in the end. And uh, they say if, if you get there in the end, you're, you're, you haven't quite lost your mind yet. But I'm on my, you know. Um, <laughs> And uh, and Isaiah invited me to do uh, one of the selected shorts, and I go, okay, sure. I figured there'd be nobody there, you know. And it's, it's Symphony Space is probably nine hundred to eleven hundred seats. I don't know, you know. Uh, it's a pretty good sized auditorium on the Upper West Side, and it's a couple blocks from my house. And this was in February, like eighty six or eighty seven. And I went and um, I went up there, and I did, the, you know, I read the thing and. Uh, he had gone over with, with me. We had a rehearsal, you know, because uh, I'd never done it before. And he just wanted to let me know what to do. And it's basically you and a lectern and the lights in the audience, you know, and uh, and you're reading and you're reading the you're reading the book, you know, and doing all the characters. And uh, and so uh, I thought, you know, I did the sound check and I, I lived two blocks away. So I went back home and had dinner and then I came back at 730 you know, or 745 and people were literally hanging from the rafters in the place. It was packed. It was just, I was like, it was like, it was like a rock concert, you know, just, and, and it turns out, and I read it and it was me and they, I got, you know, standing ovation, blah, blah, blah. They, 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 the, and so I, I, every year that Isaiah was doing these and I actually, after I moved to LA, I was still doing them for him at, uh, uh, at the Getty center, you know, and, um, you know, it was it was really fun, you know, and they would record them and they would play them on, on um, WNYC FM, you know, and in uh, the, the public station in New York. And then it was all over on on, uh, 
on NPR, you know. Uh, so it was, and I did that for almost 30 years, you know. Wow. Uh, so um, that was really fun. I do it once or twice a year, but it was fun. But it turns out that a lot of people in, in both the audiobook world and in the advertising world came to these selected short readings. And so that's how I started getting asked to, to, to do a lot of audiobooks and selected shorts and games kind of came out of that. Although I didn't start doing games till I moved to uh, LA, you know, um, first game I did was, I think I played um, uh, Boris Yeltsin in a thing called uh, in some kind of rush. It was an attack on America or something. I forget what the name is. <laughs> 1996 i'd have to look up and see what the name of it was it's on imdb i know it's still there but uh i i played Bo boris yeltsin in, uh, in going against america ah, and i was drunk too so <laughs> <laughs> were you drunk or did you just play drunk no i just played drunk. okay right. <laughs> i was playing boris yeltsin he was always drunk wasn't he that, so i'm so i'm told yeah uh, with uh, such an extensive array of uh, projects that you work on, do you have any sort of preference between film, television, audio books, or games, or are they all just different things that you enjoy for different reasons? Uh, the latter, you know, uh, there are different things that I enjoy for different reasons and, and in different ways, you know, but something that's well-written is well-written, right. you know, and it's always a pleasure to do, you know, whether it's a movie or a TV show or, you know, no, I made mean, some TV shows I've been in have been incredibly well written, you know, like uh, Supernatural or uh, or Angel, you know, or 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 Prophet, you know, or even some of the Equalizer stuff, you know. Um, and but any, you, anything that's well written, it'll still have a thriving it, fan still, base it, it, all it, these it, years later. It, and many of them do, you know, uh, surprisingly, you know, and, you know, The Dark Knight was well written, you know. I mean, it was and it was exceptionally well directed, you know. Christopher Nolan's a genius and he knows it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You had a, a role in Dark Knight. Uh, was there a story about how that came to be? Uh, or uh... There, there kind of is. I'd read for him, you know, like in April, you know, and uh, he was he really seemed to like me. And I, I got called back and, you know, um, I was like, oh, no, well, I don't know. Then I never heard anything. And then suddenly I get a call. This is like May Seven, I'd have to look and I'm not, it was like, it was like middle of May. It was a Tuesday. I got called. My agents go, do you have a passport that's valid? And I go, yes. And they go, great. We'll be right back to you. And on, by, on Thursday, I was on a plane to, to London to shoot in the dark night. Wow. That fast. That fast. Yeah. How, how long were you there shooting? Uh, I was in London for about a month, you know, and it was really fun. And Heath Ledger and uh, Gary Oldman couldn't have been nicer people, honestly. I just, they were, they were great scene mates to have, and Maggie Gyllenhaal too, you know. Um, I, 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 you know, it was, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience being on that movie. And then I'm from Chicago originally, and um, it shot in Chicago for two and a half months, and I got to go to Chicago for two and a half months. So it was even better, I got, you, you know, yeah. And I would go back and forth, you know, from LA to Chicago, because they didn't always need me, but um I, I they would they, they flew my kids out at one point you know and uh i took uh i took gary oldman's sons charlie and gully uh uh boating on lake geneva outside of chicago uh, just in wisconsin uh one afternoon you know and oh here's the story um we're out there on the boat we were basically uh body surfing you know behind the boat i was fleeing them around the water uh, on tubes, you know, or, and we had a, and, and Charlie and Gully were kind of afraid, you know, but then my kids got in and I got in and we were, we, we ended up having a really great time. We get back, it's around four o'clock. We ordered pizza, you know, deep dish pizza at this place, Gino's East out there, uh, on the, on the lake there. And suddenly I get this call from the second AD who was this beautiful young woman and, and uh, who I had a mad crush on, you know, and I thought, <laughs> oh my God, she's calling me. What? Uh, hi. Uh, uh, hello. And she goes, Keith, where are you? I go, I'm in Lake Geneva. How soon would it take you to get back to the city? I go, uh, well, it was 430. So it was rush hour. You know, it was the middle of the week. I go, um, I, and you know, I, I was, I was off that day, you know, and she goes, um, well, we need you to get back in the city. What time do you think you could be back in the city? I say, you think you could be back before dark? And I go, 
probably I can, I'm, I'm going to try. Well, we leave. So I left, we drove madly down to the city. I found out that Evanston actually has a ghetto, but because I had to go because the traffic <laughs> so bad and cut cut down Lakeshore Drive, end up getting there. And we pull under, uh, on, 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 uh, there was like at Illinois and wherever it was that we were shooting, there was, there was an upper level and a lower level. So uh, I got out. A, 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 they sent they sent a, a a PA down to pick because the kids are all in the car with me, and I, I I take them and we go. They 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 say we'll take them in the car. You have to get upstairs. I run upstairs. The the shots lined up. There's 300 extras and Gary's at Oldman's at one end and and Chris and they said go right there. And I had to go right into the, this elevator and change in the elevator oh. into my costume <laughs> and then walk out and then and then you know I get up. And all I had to do was walk out of the elevator and there's this big, long tracking shot and meet Gary. And then we walk into the building and that was it. And my nephew goes, he goes, we did all that for that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's movie making, buddy. That's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, um, I'm curious about uh, you've done a lot of acting. Have you done any um directing or writing of your own yeah i write plays and uh, uh i i ran a theater company here i was co-artistic director of ensemble studio theater the los angeles project for six and a half years uh, and i directed we had a big hit called watching oj that was written by david mcmillan who wrote on lucifer and uh he just wrote on uh, and he wrote on american horror story he wrote he, he wrote on the uh the, the jeffrey dahmer story he was one of the writers on yeah. that um, he's a young African American. Well, he's not. I'll still say he's young. He's in his thirties, you know, early thirties. That can still be young. Yeah, that can still be young. And um, and he's a terrific writer. And watching OJ was this huge hit. It was set in a in a small Inglewood like neighborhood uh, on the morning that the verdict came out in nineteen ninety six or ninety five, whatever it was. Uh, and I directed it, you know, and, and it was a huge hit and won a lot of awards and stuff. So I I, I directed a number of uh, another play there called Lost in Time, which was written by one of my writing partners, uh, Tony Pasqualini, uh, which has just been published, I think, by Drama Display Service, um, Lost in Time. And um, he and I actually co-produced and I led the writing team for our COVID project uh, at the theater, which was called, which is, we called it the Space Soap Opera. And uh, it, it's uh, it's called In Search of a Pig, a P.I.G., which is a pandemic immunity generator. And it's it chronicles the uh, adventures of Captain um, Dakota James and her crew of the USS TBD, which is composed of her uh, second in command onboard mechanic and therapeutic sex partner, Fred, uh, and, and their snarky French accented uh, holographic AI, um, Cherie, uh, which stands for uh, computer human enriched uh, uh, relatable interface. Oh. Um, and it's six <laughs> episodes and it's funny as shit. You know, it, it starts off a little slow, the first episode, but it built, we got better at it as we went along. We shot it all on, on, um, on people's uh, laptop computers or desktop computers in their homes or on their iPhones in front of green screens. And then I cut it all together and no we put way. it, we put it up, we put it on animated backdrops, you know, uh, that were driven, uh, driven, uh, drawn by our uh, designer, uh, Amanda Kneans, who's just incredibly talented. And um, Denise Crosby's in it. People may know her from Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation. She was a security on it person. I forget what the, her character's actual name was. Um, but she's she's in it. She plays Cherie, actually, you know, and she's a hologram. So she's only like 80 percent there at any given time, you know, but it's really <laughs> fun. But we had to, we shot every everybody in it is alone. All right. And then they're put in. I We had to have them look at, at spots on their wall or their desk so that they would have the right eye lines. And then we put it all together in this thing called OBS Ninja. And then I edited it, you know. Wow. So a lot actually of taking an editing. I, it was a lot of compositing, you know, and I, I learned how to do that. I had a, a great consultant named Kazu Takeda, uh, who was uh, one of our company members, who's a very proficient editor. But he said I, I wanted him to edit because, no, 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 you're going to edit it and you're just going to I'm going to consult with you. <laughs> of course, you just wanted to consult. That's so funny. Right. Had, yeah. had you done any uh, editing before that point? Well, I took an editing course at the university. Oddly enough, just I just had said I would love to take the course, you know, and they said, well, you're a professor. Sure. We'll let you take it, you know, 
and uh, and I learned how to do uh, to edit on Adobe Premiere Pro. You know, so that's what I use today for all of my editing as yeah. well. So it's just yeah. it's an amazing piece of software. It's amazing. Yeah, I just had to re up though my uh, <laughs> your subscription. The, my subscription. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as a as a professor, it was free. But then once I was done taking the course, but now now that I'm I'm not a uh, taking the course any longer, I have to yeah. pay for it, you know? No, that's, that's what happened to me. I, I got into a, a Adobe Premiere Pro when I was in college and I had, I had it for free because I was a student, but then after I graduated and I wanted to continue to do all this YouTube stuff, I had to get and, the, and, Adobe Creative Suite. Yeah. Now, now I have Adobe Creative Street, a suite as well. You know, it's, uh, I don't think it's, it's like 40, bucks. <laughs> it's, they, it's like 40 bucks a month or whatever. I forget, but it's, it's worth it. It's you definitely know. worth it. You know. Well, we're uh, coming up on about. But I'll, oh, I want to tell you where you can you, where you can see if you want to see it. Yes, absolutely. If you want to see in search of a pig, you can get it on Vimeo forward slash on demand forward slash APIG, all in lowercase. Vimeo.com slash forward slash. No, Vimeo forward slash forward slash on demand, on demand. forward slash a pig. A pig. Right. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to put a link to the description and the video on demand later for that one. Um, we've got about 10 minutes before we're going to wrap up this broadcast. We've, we're doing great on donations. We're at 11,537 now, thanks to everybody who's taken this opportunity to donate to the broadcast. I guess before we close out, um, I think there are probably a lot of uh, people watching right now who have admired the work that you've done in film, television, and in particular the voice acting for video games, who would probably want to know if you had any advice for someone who wanted to get into voice acting today. What 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 are like the top few pieces of, of advice that you would give them? Learn how to act. Learn how to read. You know, I think that that is the basic basic skill for being able to do any of this is mm -hmm. knowing how to read material and how to really get you just sink yourself into it. You know, and also I'm going to go back to something I said earlier. Look for the brass ring and recognize it when it comes. You know. Have you had many of those or just a few that you've taken advantage of? Well, I mean, the biggest one, again, was joining the organic theater. You know, mm -hmm. that was the biggest one. And then the second one was deciding to stay in New York, you know, after bleacher bums. Would you, you say know? that taking advantage of one when it comes by opens up a tree that can branch Always. off into just, others? Just, and, uh, you know, God only knows if I had... What I who knows what what I would have ended up, you know, had I not made those choices, but I did, and uh, for better or for worse, here I am now, you know, and I'm talking to you. you That's know? awesome, and we're all grateful for it. I am very grateful for it. Thank you so much, Keith. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up this broadcast. Um, we made great progress towards our go our goal. Thanks to everybody who came to watch the interview. Thanks to everybody who donated. Uh, but special thanks to Keith for taking time out of his busy holiday schedule, uh, working, continuing to work even now on audiobooks, but still taking time for the fans of all of his work to come and say hi during this holiday season. Thank you so much, Keith. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. And thank you to everyone who's watching and listening and donating. You know, awesome. And happy holidays to you all. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. You know, <laughs> happy Kwanzaa. Right. <laughs> happy everything. Yes. All right. Thanks again. And bye bye, everybody. See you next time.